Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We welcome our visitors. May God bless you. You that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. You do somebody a favor, you get on that phone out there and call a friend and have them to tune in and get this hour coming up. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up you'll enjoy the singing as well as the preaching. Take that Bible and turn with you please to the book of Ruth chapter 3. I'm bringing message number uh, 7 today. Message number 7 on the book of Ruth. And this tape today will be tape 268. Tape 268. Message number 7 on the book of Ruth. Now if you're not getting our daily broadcast, you'll tune in each day. Monday through Saturday, you can get the daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon, and we'll try to be a blessing to you then. And so, better still, you'd enjoy it if you'd pay us a visit on Sunday at the north side. Uh, we appreciate that. Getting that Bible ready and open to follow me in the Scriptures, I'm going to begin reading with verse 1 of Ruth chapter 3. I want to give you my mailing address before I read the scripture. This is a home mission work. God gave the word. Great is the company of those that publish it. We work this together in getting out the gospel. It's a faith ministry. And I want you to pray for me and write to me. Let me ask you this question. How long has it been since you've written to me? Many of you never, never have written to me. Many of you never prayed for me. I'm sure of that. Some have. May God bless you. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, the zip code number. Now in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, we find Ruth resting. Now she was serving, she was seeking grace. And now we come to the time when she's resting. Remember, Ruth is a type of a newborn person in the body of Christ. She's a type of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boaz is a type of Christ himself. And she was laboring in his field, as we saw in chapter 2. In chapter 3, verse 1, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall not I seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is it not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winneth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put on thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law had bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet, and lay her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. That's as far as I'm reading this morning. This is a very beautiful love story, one of the greatest in the Bible. And if you have followed me each Lord's Day up until now, you've seen some wonderful truths here. In chapters 1 and 2, we see grace sought after. In chapter 3, we find rest is sought after. Now she's seeking for rest. Now you must remember that she's living with a very wise woman by the name of Naomi, her mother-in-law. She had lost her husband, 
and she's living with her mother-in-law that loved her dearly. And you must remember that Naomi is a type of the nation of Israel. Ruth is a type of the church. But notice, first of all, today we see rest in verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? Now she wanted to find her a husband, if you please. She wanted to find her a, a home, a place where she could have her own home, her own husband, and a place of rest in this respect. Now Israel found rest from Egypt after the Red Sea. You remember that there was turmoil in the land of Egypt? Then after the Red Sea crossing, they found rest to a certain extent. And then when they moved through the Red Sea and on through the wilderness and across Jordan, they found rest in the land of Jordan. Now there is a rest. And whenever you're saved and then you find out that you're eternally saved, that you're in the body of Christ and you're kept by the power of God, then you can rest in the Lord. Rest as far as your soul is concerned. Don't be afraid of going to hell. Don't be afraid of getting lost again. Rest in the Lord and get busy for God, building up a reward for yourself at the end of life's journey. Many of God's people never find that rest. Oftentimes I talk with people, they're, they're saved, I believe, many of them. Later on the devil will come along and cause them to doubt and disturb them. And then they begin to wonder whether or not they're saved. And many times they go by their feelings. When they're feeling good, they say, well, I'm saved because I feel good. When they're not feeling good, they say, I must be lost because I don't feel good. Now, salvation is not based upon your feelings. And dealing with people about their souls, don't ever ask them how you feel about it. It's not their feeling. You'll deceive them. You must put them on the word of God and let them see by faith that they're saved by faith in Christ, not by feelings, not by works, not by human efforts, not by reformation or rededication or education. It's by faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing minus nothing. So we see here she's seeking rest, rest for Ruth. Now notice in the second place we see her obedience. This word obedience is a key word for every Christian. Only the obedient people are going to be blessed and rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. In verse 5, she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. Now here Ruth, this young Moabitess maiden, had the uttermost respect for her mother-in-law. And she respected her sagacity. She knew her mother-in-law was a woman that had experience. She knew her mother-in-law was a woman that had lived not only in Bethlehem prior to this time, but had spent some nine or ten years down in the land of Moab. And she had great love and great respect for her mother-in-law's wisdom. It would be good today if a lot of daughter-in-laws would take a little wisdom and advice from their mother-in-laws when they need it. That would help very much. Today you have a lot of daughter-in-laws and mother-in-laws that get in a fuss and fall out and won't speak to each other and won't visit each other and that's bad. Somebody is being robbed and someone will be held responsible. It's always good for the younger ladies to seek a little wisdom and advice uh, from the elder ladies. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said in the book of Peter, that the elder teach the younger, talking about the women. And we see here then that uh, she's given wisdom and she obeys. God said, if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Are you willing? Are you obedient? You say, preacher, I am. Well, you're going to have the best that God has for you. No doubt about that. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Somebody said, well, I'll just go ahead and sacrifice and uh, then uh, maybe that will take care of my situation instead of me being obedient. 
I've given you the story before, but it's so fitting, I want to pass it on. I was talking to a medical doctor, and he's going on now in eternity. And I was talking to him about going to church, and he said, well, he always went fishing on Sunday. I said to him, sir, I said, you need to go to God's house on Sunday. He said, well, I'll tell you what I do. He said, I go on Sunday mornings a lot of times, and I flip a $100 bill in the collection plate. And he said, if I flip that $100 bill in the collection plate, then I think that'll take care of me for not being there for the night service. Now, what he's saying is he's going to sacrifice instead of being obedient. That's not God's way. God would not accept that. You can't bribe God. You can't buy God over. You must be willing and obedient and go God's way. Now, the power of the Spirit was received by an act of obedience. Many of us live somewhat of a dry life and not filled with God's Spirit, not really running over spiritually. It's because of disobedience. The Bible says in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, we are His witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey Him. Now, do you want the fullness of God's Spirit? There must be an act of obedience. You won't get far from God unless you do have the fullness of God's Spirit to help you and bless you and lead you. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 19, the Apostle Paul said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Paul always did that that he knew was right inside of God. He thought was right. He wouldn't let anyone deter him or deviate him from the right path. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He was not. Now, because of Ruth's obedient to Boaz, she's now a candidate for arrest. She was obedient not only to her mother-in-law, but she was obedient to this man Boaz, who is a type of the Savior. She was obedient in chapter 2 when she said, Go not glean in another field. He told her that. He said, Don't go and glean in another field. He said, you go and serve God and, and uh, pick up the grain in my field. Boaz, the type of Jesus. You need to be careful and know that you're serving God in his field, in his vision, where God placed you. You should find the will of God without a shadow of a doubt and serve God in that field if you want God's best. He said, now don't go glean in another field. You have a lot of grasshopper church members today. They hop around from one place to another, never satisfied anywhere. Sit in your service so you can preach them the truth and warn them and tell them, go out the door like they had wax in their ears, never hear a thing you say, or just wander around, join anything that comes along, and believe anything just about it that uh, some uh, cult leader will tell them. And it's pathetic. You need to find the will of God and stay put and serve God and follow the man of God in the scriptures. And if he's telling you the truth, you need to abide by the truth. If he's not preaching the truth, then don't support him. Don't listen to him. Go somewhere where the truth is being preached. Beloved, the Bible said he, he told him to, her to go and don't go to another field. She was in the right place at the right time in the right field. Not only that, he said, stay with the maidens. Chapter 2 and verse 22. And she was obedient to that. She stayed with the maidens. In other words, Boaz had taken a liking to Ruth. She's a beautiful woman. And he liked her. She's attractive. And there's something about her that caught his eye. And he said, I want you to stay close to my maidens. I have some good women down there working in my field. They're gleaning down there, some of them widow women, some orphans, and they're down there gleaning, trying to get a little grain to survive on. And when you go down into my field, I want you to stay close to the maidens. I have some men down there. They'll be looking at you and flirting with you and, and uh, talking to you. But said, you stay close to my maidens. Stay close to those women. That's why your place is to be. And he told those men, he said, I want you to let that girl alone. I want her to be protected. Don't you bother her. 
And when she want a rest, let her go into the rest tent. When she wants some water, see she has some water. And give her some handfuls on purpose. But he said to her, I want you to glean with the maidens. Now there's certain people you need to associate with. Now that crowd you run with before you got saved, and they are not willing to get right with God, the quicker you get rid of them, the better off you'll be. If you don't, they're going to have one foot back out in the world and be pulling you in that direction. If you can't influence them into God's house, into the family of God, you better find you some better friends to associate with. They'll drag you back into the world. they got the devil on their side, and they'll drag you into the world. You stay with God's people. You stay by the maidens. You stay by the clean, upright, uh, Christ-loving, church-loving people of God. That's the crowd you'd associate with. When God saved me, I left that drinking crowd and gambling crowd and pool playing crowd and dancing crowd and carousing crowd. I left that gang when God saved me. I couldn't fool around with that crowd. I knew if I did, they'd have me right back out there in the world. And so I left them. And they left me. Really, if you get on fire for God, uh, they will, you won't have to leave them. They'll leave you. But if you just hobnob around, push your foot and compromise, saw soap and backpedal, then they'll hang in there and drag you out. But if you'll put your feet down and get your feet on the ground and your head in heaven, and serve God, they'll fall off of you, leave you like fleas off of a dead dog. You won't have to worry about them. Well, that crowd never did come and say, uh, uh, Virg, I, we want to come pay you a visit. Never saw any of them. After I got saved, they didn't come around. They didn't come around and say, Now, Virg, I want, to, I want you back at the poker game Friday night. No, no, I didn't see that crowd. They didn't, they didn't come around. They didn't come and say, well, there's going to be a, a, a wonderful dance over the way and, and we want you to go. No, when I got saved, I didn't, I, they didn't come around talking to me like that because I made up my mind. I was going to serve in the field where God put me and they just left me. And now they'll leave you too. But if you lie down with the dogs, you're going to get up with fleas on you and quit playing around and hobnobbing around this worldly crowd if you can't get them in, then leave them alone and work with God's people, serve God's people, find somebody you can win to Jesus Christ. Now he said, you go and you remain by the maidens. You stay with those good girls down there, those widow women, they're fine people. Now you stay with them. Don't get across the hedgerow into somebody else's field. You got no business down there among those men. They're cutting the grain. You stay with those women and work with them. He gave her good advice. He's a type of Jesus, and she's a type of new convert of the type of the church. Number three, the harvest is over. The gleaning is now done. They had been cutting grain, and they'd cut all the grain down. They'd shock the grain. They'd brought it in. They'd picked up the gleanings, and the harvest is over now. The gleaning is done. No more cutting the grain. The season's over. No more picking up the Droppings on the ground out of the stalks there. Uh, they just, everything is cleaned up. All the gleaning is taken care of now. The night is come. The Bible said the night is coming when no man can work. We're living today in the day of gleaning. We're living in not the harvest time. We're living gleaning now. You're not getting many people saved now. Most people now are going to hell. Very few people are getting saved now. And they're going into hell like mad every day. While this world is getting more and more wicked, the Bible said it would. There's more criminals, more drunkards, more dope addicts, more cusses, more fighters out, on, out there today than there's ever, ever been before. And it's getting worse all the time. Uh, crime was on the increase last year, 17.5% in Atlanta, Georgia, and over the state of Georgia. Don't let anybody tell you that crime is on the decrease. It's on the increase. One reason is because you got so many of these liberals, infidel, spineless, soul soaping uh, lawyers and judges and people on the jury that don't have guts and backbone enough to do what God said in this book. Or you say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Now let me clear up something. We have some as fine a judges around Athens, Georgia, as you'll find anywhere. 
We have some as fine a lawyers as you'll find anywhere. And we thank God for every one of them. But you're always going to have these liberals, these infidels, and then whenever you get a, a selected jury, you can select a jury on capital punishment. Some man is killed, a group of people and robbed and mistreated and abused them. And you can ask these people, you believe in capital punishment? Oh yeah, I believe in capital punishment. And those lawyers, uh, that the defense lawyer, he'll try to pick out something you think he can sway. And they put them there in the jury box. And then they prove without a shadow of a doubt that that man is a cold-blooded murderer. Now what did God say ought to be done with that man? What God said ought to be done has never been abrogated. God said that man is to be punished. And God said, let me tell you how to punish him. God said a way to punish that man is put him to death. Now if you don't put that man to death, you're not doing what God said to him. You're sinning against God. You're sinning against the family of the man whose victim was slain and robbed and killed and mutilated. And you're sinning against uh, the state of Georgia. You're sinning against all law-abiding people in the state of Georgia. Now, wait a minute. I'm not through. If you have 12 men on the jury and nine of them wants to do what God said to put the man to death, three of them says, no, let's don't put him to death. Then they sit there and look at one another for hours. And then finally the nine people, they give in with the three people that wants to let him live. And then they let him live. Now every crime that man commits, they let live. Everybody he murders and kills, all the, the devil he does. And then all it's going to cost to keep him up and keep him in prison. And whatever he does wrong and whoever he murders... Those nine people that gave in to the three people is going to be just as guilty as they are because they gave in. The nine people that said he ought to go to the lecture chair should stay firm, say, no, we got conviction, we're going to do what God said do, and we'll set here hell freezes over before we'll change. And then if they can't get together, let them come out in the hung jury, and you got a good judge sitting there that knows what to do, and many of them do, and most of them do, that judge would put him in the hot seat. That judge would take care of him. But if you give in to that person, one person, two or three, that says, no, don't put him to death, and you agree with that person, God is going to hold you responsible for everything wrong that that criminal does. If he kills men, their blood's going to be on your hands. Not only that, God's going to hold you responsible for having to cause the, the tax-abiding citizens to pay tax and have to pay for that jaybird for many years in prison. God will hold you responsible for that. And not only that, God's going to hold you responsible for encouraging other people to commit crime because they say, don't you see, if he can commit a crime like that, kill two or three people, get by with it, then if we get caught, uh, then they're not going to put me in an electric chair. I'll get by with it too. And the nine that agreed with the three is going to be just as guilty as the three of encouraging other criminals to go out and commit the same kind of crime that that devil committed. Now you better listen to this Baptist preacher. I'm telling you the truth whether you like it or not. I'm not going to have the blood of people like that on my hands. If I'm on the jury and they got a man there that's committed cold blood murder and, and they um, prove without a shadow of doubt he committed cold blood murder you think I'd ever give in for a life sentence? No, sir. Like I said a moment ago, I'll sit there till hell freeze over and the, and the, the, the devil's angels come out on skating, skating on, on, on ice skates before I'd give in. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. You'll answer to God. Just because you gave in, don't solve it. You'll answer to God for giving in. You'll ask for God for not doing what God said in this book. And that's exactly why we have so many criminals and lawbreakers and murderers and drunkards and dope addicts in the land today is because we got no backbone. Now, judicial system is in shambles today. Unless something's done about it, we're in a sad situation. That's coming a time when you'll have to go with your wife to the grocery store and carry a gun in order to get your groceries unless something is done. We're living in a sad hour and it's getting worse. And you better watch every mile you drive on the highway. Some drunk coming down the road, if you're walking beside the highway, he'll run over you and kill you like a dog. 
He'll cut across the yellow line or cut across on your side, hit you head on, and kill you because he's a drunken murderer. And every man that gets under the stern wheel and gets drunk and drives down the highway and kills somebody, he's a cold-blooded murderer. He ought to be put in the electric chair. Yeah, that's right. If you don't like that, you can lick that one too. Beloved, you listen to me. We've got to do something about crime in this country. A man ought to have more sense than to drink a barrel of liquor and get on the steering wheel of an automobile and drive down the highway. If he ain't got no more sense than that, then he need to be learning some sense. Black man up here in Atlanta, running around calling himself a, a reverend. He's been caught drunk and driving drunk I don't know how many times. I don't see how in the world he drives. He always keeps his driving license to go out and start trouble somewhere. Listen to me. We need to be fair. But let me listen. A man that's going to get drunk time and time again, you catch him drinking, take his driving license, don't let him drive anymore. Unless he grows old and learns a little sense, then you might let him drive if he'll stay in the right place. God help us. Now that's not my sermon. I'm telling you about it this morning. You better listen to me. I'm telling you the truth. This Baptist preacher is telling you the truth. There's a plague hit this country. There's a plague hit this country that may warp out half of the world. Like the black plague in the dark ages. And that plague is AIDS. We may never get a cure for AIDS. That thing may warp out half of the human race. Yeah. Beloved, that's serious. And you take people like Liberace that, that was a homosexual and uh, died with AIDS and tried to cover it up. Beloved, listen to me. People are dying with AIDS every day and it's multiplying and you need to do everything you can about it. You say, preacher, what can we do? Behave yourself. You know what to do. Behave yourself. These people out here that's got AIDS are the ones not behaving themselves. And you know what's right and what's not right. And you better do it because that's just spreading all over this world. And it may warp out half of the human race or more. That's a curse that God Almighty is sent on the homosexual. And it's spreading all over uh, the country today. And uh, dope addicts, um, uh, because of the dope they take in and the shots they're putting on, many of them winding up with AIDS. And it's pathetic. In Russia, they only have 20 people there with AIDS in Russia. And those are foreigners that brought them in there. The Russians said, we do not want an American army camp near our borders. We don't want our men and women to get AIDS over here. It's a shame. It's a disgrace. When people from all over the world look at America being filled with people with AIDS and doing nothing much about it. God help us. One of these days, the world's going to look on us in shame. And we're going to be called an AIDS nation full of that type of disease that kill people. And it's a sad, sad situation. And people need to behave themselves lest they come up with AIDS. Well, I, that's not my sermon, but I preached it anyhow. Okay, the Bible said now, uh, you go out and, and stay in the right field, and the harvest is past, the sum is ended, we're not saved. The gleaning in the end time, Luke chapter 18, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. What are you saying, preacher? Luke chapter 17, verse 26 tells you, As it was in the days of Noah, so should be in also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. How many people did they have saved in the days of Noah? Eight. Noah had eight members in his church. Our church is getting smaller and smaller in attendance. Today we have the visible... And the invisible church today. We have the visible church on Sunday morning. And the invisible church on Sunday night and Wednesday nights. Isn't that something? And those that help make up the invisible church are going to answer to God for it. Going to give an account to God for the apostasy and being caught in the apostasy. And being part of the invisible church. By not being able to be seen in God's house on the Lord's day. We're living in a day when people on Wednesday night to go anywhere they want to. They hear somebody sick or dead or whatnot, they can take off anywhere they want to. If they want to go see Aunt Jane, they can go. Or uh, Aunt Susan, they can go. Then go anywhere they want to. If they want to take off on Sunday, they can do that. When they got all the week to do it in, they don't care about God's house. 
They don't care about the word of God and prayer. They don't care if the church closes its door, close her up. We we'll all go to hell, they say. Well, we're headed in that direction. If there's ever been a time when God's people ought to sacrifice and put forth that special effort, be in God's house, serve God, be at the post of you just right now, I'd be afraid to sit in my house on Wednesday night and look at a TV set when there's a prayer meeting going on in my church. I'd be afraid to do it and call myself a child of God. And I certainly wouldn't say I love Jesus. I certainly wouldn't say I love the church. I certainly wouldn't say I love Bible study and prayer meeting. I wouldn't say that because I know I'd be lying. Beloved, that's a dangerous thing. You need to get your heart in the work of God. Put forth that special effort. You got time for every old oh, preacher, I'm so tired. Well, you're not tired doing anything else you want to do. I contend in the house of God on Wednesday night and Sunday night or any time, you can find rest for your body. You can find rest. You can leave the house of God rested when you're going to get ready to go home. You can. Say amen, owe me one. Amen. Well, fine. I got three amens. I appreciate them. The Bible says, was the days of Noah, so should it be in the days that come the Son of Man. That's getting worse all the time. Many churches already close the doors on Sunday nights. Many of them have no Wednesday night services. And a little baker's dozen out on Sunday morning. And the devil's taken over. Drunks and dope addicts and murders and robbers and people that have AIDS and homosexuals and uh, plain old queers and everything else can be named is taken over in this country and we're headed straight to hell as a modern to its good. There's every time when God's people need to stand up, straighten up, speak up, it's right now. If you're not willing to do it, you'll ask that God for it in the day of judgment. Let's stand our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today that you take the message and use it, that you speak to every heart. God, I pray that Jesus might be honored. Have your way in this invitation, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us. And as Debbie plays, if you're in this building, and God is speaking to your heart about anything, salvation, re-education, United with the church, for any cause, you and you alone know. You walk out and come down here, let us help you. Wash your place. Would you obey the Lord?